Um, next talk is given by uh, Gamze Gursoy, Gamze Gursoy um, about the quantification of private information leakage and privacy preserving file formats for functional genomics data. Thank you. Thanks to organizer for organizers for giving me this opportunity. Um, I'm a postdoc at Yale working with Mark Gerstein and uh, we are interested in genome privacy, but particularly genome privacy of this uh, data group that is sort of overlo overlooked over the years is the functional genomics data. Um, so I hope I don't need to convince you guys that data is important, and more specifically, biomedical data can save lives. So we believe that a foundation of a good healthcare lies on the, the um, basic research many of us do in the area of uh, areas of transcriptomics, epigenetics, and genetics. Um, because of this feedback and the relationship, now our subjects that we do the research on are becoming uh, more and more real individuals rather than uh, model organisms, for example. And that creates a privacy problem as far as the sharing goes. But we want to share the data because it's important for testing new pipelines, for rapid advancement of biomedical data, bi biomedical science and reproducibility and so forth. But there is, uh, sharing creates problems because especially if, uh, if this data is coming from DNA of real individuals, then you're giving out private information about these individuals. So um, traditionally, genome privacy um, focus on DNA data, the genetic data that comes from DNA, uh, classical DNA sequencing experiments. So over the past decade, we've seen that there is leakage in GVAS studies. Uh, you can actually cross-reference people, uh, people's addresses by looking at their, let's say, uh, personal genome profiles, and uh, you can even um, infer people's last names from, from their genome. What I'm going to talk about today is the leakage that comes from transcriptomics and epigenetics data. So um, transcriptomics and epigenetics data traditionally, their focus and purpose is to infer biological information about um, disease versus um, normal cells, for example. You want to know if a TF transcription factor is bound on a genome that has a disease or not. You want to know what are the important genes for the development of uh, developmental stages. So, um, but it still comes with the sequence in information. However, um, you can imagine that it's um, the, the, sequence, the sequencing data that comes from these experiments are uh, less abandon, abundant in the genome. So if you have a transcription factor that is not bound everywhere in the genome, then the coverage from this data you get is very small. And uh, traditionally, the read lengths are also very small. So for example, if you have read length of 30 base pair of an um, experiment from a transcription factor that is not bound to many places in the genome, then you will get a um, very small amount of reads. Then the question becomes, does this really does this data really leak uh, information about the individual? Because with the classical um, genotype detection algorithms, you may not be able to see these um, SNVs because um, there's not enough depth in the data. You have, let's say, a million um, reads with 30 base pair lengths, so maybe you cannot see anything. So then, um, but most importantly, that um, if you look at the life cycle of these experiments, then uh, you may actually think that there might be a lot of leakage, especially when it comes to RNA sequencing data. So if you want to, for example, if you want to uh, know the gene, gene expression in different tissues from the same individual, you take uh, samples from these individuals' different tissues, you send it to the sequencer, sequ and then you overlap all these sequences with known genes, and then you can say in which sample which gene is expressed. And what you want at the end is, is this matrix, matrix of genes versus um, samples, but it comes with this data, and this might take us back to the individual. So, so then the question becomes, as I told before, that how much information in, this, uh, in these ex uh, experiments? Because currently the, the policies regarding to sharing of functional genomics data is very ad hoc. A great example is HeLa's genome. So you, can, you cannot find a HeLa's genome. It's locked. You have to have a, uh, special permission to access the data. But if you want to know about the chip uh, of uh, HeLa's genome, you can actually search PubMed and then get the sequencing reads from, uh, chip sequencing reads from, uh, from 
different transcription factor binding or histone modification experiments. Same for the RNA-seq, but it's less of a case for RNA-seq. So if there is um, information leakage in this data, then how can we protect this information while still sharing this data? So those are the two questions I like to answer in this talk. So we took an uh, information theory-based approach. The analogy is that if you have a noisy radio channel and you have an input and you get a signal, you want to know what the input is, then it depends on how abundant your signal is. So if you're hearing a word that is very abundant in your um, daily speech, like the, then you're not going to learn much about the imp input. But if you're hearing a word that is not very common, then you, you might guess what the input is. So using the same analogy that the functional genomics experiments and the genotyping that you do from these experiments are very noisy because you don't have much coverage. Um, the sequencing is not really as high quality as the DNA sequencing experiments. So you have a biosample, you do functional genomics experiments, and then you get these noisy genotypes. If the genotypes that you get is um, common in the population, then you don't learn much about this individual. But if you're actually capturing some of the rare variants, then you might um, learn a lot about this individual. So basically, we, we quantify the information based on the genotyping frequency of the variant that you uh, genotype from the functional genomics experiment reads. So based on that, we can actually come up with se uh, several measures. Um, if you already know these individual's um, genotypes, then you have a gold standard. And you can look at the gold standard genotypes and um, intersect it with the genotypes that you get from the functional genomics experiments, and then quantify the information in that intersection, which is called the pointwise mutual information. And then you can tell, with respect to this gold standard, how much information this experiment um, is leaking. So what we can do also further, uh, we can actually subsample sub reads from the chip, chip sequencing or RNA sequencing experiment. And for each subsample reads, we do the genotyping, intersect it with gold standard, and quantify the information. And now we can compare it with the, um, with the gold standard um, uh, information that you would get if you have the high quality genotypes. So from this plot, what you can say, it's not surprising that as you sample more reads, you will get more information. It's also not surprising that high-depth experiments like, like HiC will give you better genotypes compared to experiments like single-cell RNA-seq or ChIP-seq. But this does, still doesn't tell us that is this in, if this information is enough um, to link this individual to, to their full genotypes, or what can you learn from this uh, little amount of information you get, for example, from single-cell RNA-seq data. So what we did is we designed a very simple linking attack scenario where you have these low depth experiments and you also subsample the reads, so you have very low coverage. And then you do the genotyping and you have a, uh, let's say, a genotyping panel with a lot of individuals in it. So what you do is you use every single individual's genotype in this panel as the gold standard and then you intersect with the genotypes you got from functional genomics experiments you quantify the pointwise mutual information, and then the highest ranked pointwise mutual information belongs to the individual that you are querying. So, and it, especially if this individual's um, PMI value is um, a lot different than the rest of the um, population in that uh, genotyping panel. So what we, sh we are showing here that even though these low uh, coverage experiments like single cell RNA-seq or CHIP-seq, even though they don't you don't, they don't leak much information. You, don't, you cannot use it for uh, high quality genotyping. You can actually link these individuals um, to the databases by using this small amount of information you get from them. So then, um, furthermore, what if this individual is not in a database? What can you learn by looking at these um, chip sequencing or RNA sequencing experiments. So what you can do is you can take all the publicly available chip seq and RNA seq data, you can put all these BAM files together, do genotyping, and get um, some number of uh, genotypes. And then on top of that, you can use the population LD structure and impute the rest of the genotypes, and you can actually assemble almost full um, set of genotypes of this individual by using these experiments. And you can even infer um, uh, some private phenotypes by just looking at the reads from these experiments. So I guess there is no question that these experiments, that the reads from these experiments leak uh, private information, even at very low coverages. 
But we believe that the sharing of such data is very important for reprodu reproducibility uh, for the advancement of biomedical uh, data science. So then we came up some, with some means to protect individuals' privacy while being able to share this data publicly. And uh, we created this file format manipulation called uh, Privacy Aware Binary Al Alignment Map based on the known BAM and SAM file formats. So basically what we do is we use suppression and generalization for certain columns of the BAM files that you don't need it for, you don't need to have those columns for the quantification of gene expression, for example. They are just there because you get it from the aligner or from the, from the mapper. So you can actually suppress or generalize do these columns and you can still quantify transcription factor binding or uh, gene expression. But when you do that, because you're suppressing and generalizing, generalizi you're suppressing some of the fields, you are actually adding some noise to the data. So, so to, to quantify the noise, what we do is we look at the gene quantifications or TF binding quantifications from the real BAM files and that versus the gene quantifications from the, the PBAM files. And then this difference is quantified uh, as something called epsilon, and if your epsilon is very close to zero, then you know that your, the utility of these files are high. So um, we actually quantified base pair resolution and exon resolution uh, signal profiles from BAM files and the PBAM files with, um, by removing certain uh, type of uh, variants. For example, we can remove variants that, are, um, that have certain minor allele frequencies, or we can remove all the split reads, or we can remove just mismatches. Uh, you can choose what to remove, or you can remove everything. And then, as you can see in this plot, that our epsilon values are very close to zero, so that these files have high utilities while protecting um, the sequence information from, from the people who, um, that you're distributing to. Um, so this new file format or file manipulation system works well with many functional genomics pipelines, including STAR for signal tracks, RSAM for gene expression quantification, and MAX2 for ChIP-seq uh, peak calling. And also we created these software suites called, um, suite called P-Tools, where you can take a BAM file, create a PBAM file, and create these small files called .diff files, where uh, you put all the sensitive information but they are a lot smaller than the uh, BAM files. And then you can go back and forth between BAM and PBAM files with, uh, if you have the reference genome that you, you map this data to. So basically you don't, need to, um, you don't need to store the original BAM file, which is large in some cases. You can just store this small .d file, lock it up, and then use the PBAMs for your quantifications. So with this and with the previous work that we did in the lab, we can now quantify private information leakage at every step of the functional genomics data um, processing. So we start, in, in this talk, I talk about the leakage from the reads itself. Uh, we showed this year that there's leakage in the signal tracks, and then uh, we showed previously that there's actual leakage at the, uh, at, at the gene quantification, quantification levels. So you can see that we can um, tell how many potential, number of potential SNPs you can leak from uh, each sets of data. And uh, we created this triangle where here in the bottom of the triangle, the utility of the data is high, but you have high private, private information leakage. As you go up, the utility goes lower because you, you have high level information about the experiment but then there's not much private information leakage. So our modified reads, reads sets in a good place where you, you get high utility and also basically utility and privacy balance. So with this, I'd like to thank the members of your STEAM lab, uh, specifically Mark, Arif, Molly, and Fabio, and our collaborator, Professor Brenner from uh, UC Berkeley, BD2K and ISCB for bringing me here, and um, BD2K for the, for the support, and also our lab is hiring postdocs. If you're interested in genome privacy, please apply. And also if you have work in uh, genome privacy or biological data privacy that you wanna share with us, please uh, consider submitting to PSB. We are having a session on genome privacy. Thank you.
Yes, you, you, you lose that. So you have to do it when you're converting from BAM to PBAM. So that for that, you need to access the, to the BAM files, yeah. But if I would provide multiple versions of the PBAM files uh, with different filters, yeah. would yeah. that give me, uh, again, the leakage, uh, the leak, I mean, would that leak the information again? Um, yeah, so for example, what I did here, I removed, for example, in the last case, I removed all the split reads, right? So it's basically the certain number of mismatches. They are all removed. Um, but then you end up with a lot of mismatches and small indels. Then that will still leak information. So I think it's not safe unless you remove everything, all the mismatches, indels, and split reads. But, uh, but I guess I'm, what I'm wondering is uh, if I look at the epsilons, I could probably yeah. Um, I, that's possible, yes. Yeah. That is possible. But you need to have the BAM file to look at the epsilons, right? But if I have multiple P BAM files, I can quantify each of them? Oh, I see. Different, different degrees. Yes, you can do that, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, yesterday I heard some talks on uh, the MPEG-G uh, format that's coming forward. I'm just curious uh, if there's any correlation between this. Will that suffer from some of the same leakage? Uh, or how that might um, apply. I don't know that format, but uh, the reason why we did PBAMs is because we wanted it, the file format to base on BAM and SEM files, so that because there are already a lot of pipelines out there for functional genomics experiments, so we want people to be able to use their existing pipelines with a file format. So if you create a different file format, then uh, you have to change the code. So that's why we base it on uh, BAM and SEM files. And you can use it with SAM tools as well, so that's also another advantage. Thank you.